morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. We're gathered here today to celebrate the 507th anniversary of the Reformation. I'm glad all of you are here. I invite you to stand as you're able for our confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may have life in your will, and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson is from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. <coughs> we'll read responsibly Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains be toppled into the depths of the sea. Though its waters rage and foam, and though the mountains 
mountains tremble at its tumult. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jesus is our stronghold. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Call on this sister. She shall not be overthrown. But I shall adore her at the break of the day. The nations make much ado, and the kingdoms are shaken. God has spoken, and the earth shall melt away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now and look upon the works of the Lord. What awesome things he has done on earth. It is he who makes war to cease in all the world. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still then and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. For the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our son. The second reading is from Romans chapter 3, beginning with the 19th verse. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works prescribed by the law. Here ends the reading. forever. 
the sun remains forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. <coughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I have been fascinated by truth since Ruby Giuliani's comment, truth is not true. I mean, truth is such a simple word. We've been using it all our lives. In the dictionary, truth is defined as the true or actual state of matter. You know, like he tried to find out the truth. Also means conformity with fact or reality. Verity, you know, like the truth of a statement. It can also mean a verified or indisputable fact, proposition, principle, or the like. You know, like mathematical truths. <laughs> yeah, it really helps, doesn't it? <laughs> in our reading for today, we hear Jesus say, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Truth has an additional meaning in God's world. Think about the story of Noah's Ark and the flood. God has given us this story to put meaning to what God wants us to do and how God wants us to live. Now, we know from science and archaeology that the whole world was never flooded that deep at one time. I mean, one scientist wrote a book about how the earth would have been floated if it had been flood flooded with that much water. But our Bible is not a science book. Our Bible is the history of God and God's people. And the story is true to us because our God has given it to us. Same is true of the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, if we're classifying this story in a literature class, we call it fiction. Jesus calls it a parable, a story. But Jesus has given us this story to describe to us what God expects us to know about serving our neighbors by defining neighbors. Now, the truth has been under attack since the very beginning of time. We look back at creation and see that Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world and had only one prohibition. That one thing they were prohibited to do was eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Of course, Satan came along and said, is that really true? Did God really mean that you shouldn't eat from that fruit, which is pleasing to the eye? Certainly would taste very good. Satan attacked God's truth. We go down through history and we see the question comes up time and time again. When Jesus stood before Pilate, the Roman governor Pilate, demanded to know if Jesus was a king. Jesus said, you're right. I came to testify to the truth. And Pilate asked, what is truth? Pilate acted as if he didn't know the truth. Now, in our day and age, God's truth is daily assaulted and attacked. In fact, we're told that society no longer accepts or believes in absolute truth. Truth today depends on how a person determines whether it's relevant in his or her life. Today, we learn again that there is truth. There is an absolute truth of God and scriptures. When the Lord tells us there's sin, <laughs> there is sin. When the Lord tells us there is forgiveness, there is also forgiveness. Even though the world might disagree, even though Satan would assault the fact that there is truth, there is truth. As our text tells us this morning, the truth shall make you free. The truth, as the Lord points out in our text, is that we are not slaves. We're God's children. Believers are not slaves. This is the truth that will set you free. In the Gospel of John, Jesus once again was opposed by those who were against his teachings. 
They did not like it when Jesus said he was the Son of God. There were also those who opposed his authority, wondering where he got that power to do and perform miracles. Jesus defends his teaching. Jesus talks about his authority, which came from God. We are told the result of the preaching of his word. We're told even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. That was the truth that set them free. When Jesus said that he came to set them free, their reaction was really quite different. You would think they'd be happy to not be bound by the law anymore. And the Jews always relied on the fact that it was Abraham who believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. The Jews of Jesus' time thought this faith of Abraham was enough for them to get into the kingdom of heaven. They said, we've never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? And how mistaken they were. And not just because they forgot about all those years in Egypt. Jesus' answer to them was quite simple. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. He reminded them that indeed they were enslaved by sin, which enslaved the whole world. His message of truth for them was that they had been set free from sin. Jesus' message of truth for them was that he came as the Son of God and the Savior of the world to pay the price for all their sins and their rebellion. And today we are reminded that the truth of Scripture is that sin is still sin. Each and every day we sin against God in our thoughts, with our words, and by our actions. That's the truth of Scripture. Again, the world tries to deny truth and tries to say that sin is such an old word. Sin is outdated and doesn't apply to us today. But it does. At times, because of our sinful nature that we're born with, we're held captive by sin. There's no escaping sin this side of them. It doesn't make any difference if we commit great sins, many sins, few sins, just one sin. And the world is no help to a sinner, is it? We think of Luther and his struggle with his faith in the church. The church at this time was teaching the fact that a person could buy his or her way out of purgatory into heaven. And if you look through the scriptures, you're not going to find any price that we can pay to get into heaven. That was a struggle for Luther, because he too, as he examined the scriptures, he could not find anything that said he could buy his way into heaven. The church also taught that if you worked hard enough and you did enough good deeds, this would cover up some of your sins. Again, as Luther looked in scriptures, he could not find anything that said this. These were the promises that the church held out for the people and were some, that we are sometimes slaves to sin. We sometimes fall prey to Satan himself. We all, at times, fall under the spell of the allurements of this world. But the truth is that the Lord has set us free, and we are free indeed. We're thankful that as Luther struggled with this idea of freedom, as he struggled with a sin-burdened conscience, the Lord opened up his heart to see that there was freedom in the righteousness of Christ. For the longest time, when Luther read in scripture about the righteousness of God, he thought it was the wrath of the holy God that stood opposed to him. And after he studied it time and time again in the book of Romans, he came to realize that the righteousness of God also is what covers up sin. It is that righteousness that covers up our sin. It is that righteousness of Christ, his perfect sacrifice, his innocent blood and sufferings and death that sets us free. That's the truth that sets us free. We're no longer slaves to sin. We have power to overcome sin. We're no longer held captive by Satan because we have the power to defeat sin. Rather than you and I facing the end of our life and ending up on the side of Satan, instead we've been set free. 
you and I end up on our Savior's side. The truth has set us free, and we're no longer slaves to the things of this world. Instead, we're God's children. And Jesus wanted the Jews to understand that they were children of God. Jesus heard them say time and time again that they were Abraham's descendants. Abraham was their forefather. They were children of Abraham by their physical birth. Their physical lineage on earth meant nothing to Jesus. Abraham could not believe for the rest of his descendants. They had to come to faith on their own. Jesus was trying to explain to them and point out the fact that their spiritual birth that made them children of God was far more important than the fact that they were children of Abraham. He says to them, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. He wanted them to forget about Abraham for a bit. Jesus said, if you listen to me, you will follow me. If you hold to my teaching, you're going to belong to me. What a great blessing that would be if these people would give up their former way of life and believe in the sacrifice of Christ as their Savior. Now the Jews were thinking they were children of Abraham. But Jesus said, you're going to be my disciples. You're going to be my children, and you will belong to my house forever. This is how our text ends. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That would be free from the thinking that their past history was good enough to save them. They would be free and understand that the Son of God was indeed their Savior. When we look at the grace that comes to us by the watchwords of the Reformation, Believers are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, by scripture alone. When we look at grace alone, we have to see an awesome blessing and mystery that is for us. For you and I as believers cannot claim that Abraham was our father. We cannot claim that we were born of that chosen race of Israel. By nature, we're Gentiles. But God in his grace sends us his message not just to the children of Israel by birth, but to you and I, who are Gentiles, we're children of Israel by faith. That is God's grace. Paul writes in Ephesians, the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. We share in the eternal promise. Because God has chosen us by his grace to be his children, to be his believers. That's the freedom that you and I have. God's truth is still true. The world might deny it. The world might even reject it. But God's word and its truth is still the truth. We can't escape the fact that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But the truth has set us free. We are no longer slaves to sin. The new person within us, alive by God's grace, follows in the footsteps of Jesus. The truth sets us free because we're no longer children of Satan, but instead God's own children, brothers and sisters of the Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our freedom. Our freedom is that we receive is what we receive from God's truth, that we are saved by grace alone, we're saved by faith alone, and we're saved by scripture alone. And that reminds us that we're no longer slaves, but are God's beloved children. Amen. About a week ago, I attended a Owensboro Davis County Ministerial Association been a member of this group for about 10 years. And our, our leader shared with us a prayer that was written by Rabbi David Wittschoster, who is the rabbi of Temple Ada of Israel in Lexington, Kentucky. He talks about the Torah, which in, the, in some cases we think of as the first five books, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or sometimes it's the whole Hebrew Bible. But he had to think of Torah as our whole Bible of scriptures. And listen to this prayer. Rejoicing in the Torah, 
doesn't require us to find joy in every verse. It doesn't mean that we concur with every choice made by the people in it. It doesn't demand that we defend the indefensible or excuse the inexcusable. It doesn't imply that we should be happy about passages that break our hearts. Rejoicing in the Torah is found in the freedom to study it when, where, and with whom we wish. We experience happiness with it when we wrestle with its conflicts and struggle with its challenges. It becomes a source of gladness when even its most disturbing passages increase our desire to do good. It is a tree of life when we treat all life with care, a light to the eyes. When we look where we're going, a path of peace when it inspires us to work for a better world. As we restart the process of reading it, let our renewed study bring newfound hope, meaning, and joy. May this be our blessing, and let us say amen. Thank you. 